What I'm going to do now is something I've never done before. We're going to open up to Q&A, but I'm putting myself on a timer. So I'm going to have my team spread out. There's four of you. And I'm going to open it up, and we're going to get as many questions as we can in, but I only get to talk for a grand total of 10 minutes in aggregate. So try to keep your questions short, and then we're going to kind of wrap things up a little bit, OK? What do we got? Over in the corner, is there a microphone nearby? There we go, Scott. Thanks. Very nice job tonight. You told us what the top sectors were through each of recent decades. What do you project will be the top performing sector through the 2010s? Uh, you mean for, for the, neck, the, the decade we're in right now? Well, I um, uh, am a huge proponent of emerging market investing, but I do not believe that what most people consider emerging market investing will be the top performer. Um, what people consider emerging market investing is primarily huge export countries. They're just absolutely selling the bejeebers out of, pro of product to develop countries. And so your Chinas and things like that. I'm not particularly optimistic about that area, but I'm very optimistic about the emerging markets that don't have the $14 trillion debts, that have a real healthy infrastructure, and are actually seeing a huge middle class develop in their own countries. It's very volatile. There's risk to it. But I have a heavy overweighting for my clients in emerging markets. And that's not a one year or two year call. That's at least a, a decade long call that I'm very, very bullish on. And I talk constantly, of course, about dividend oriented investments. I do believe we're in a secular bull market for commodities, natural resources. I don't believe a lot of clients have the stomach for those things that they think they do. But ultimately, I see those prices rising. And, and so those would be kind of my top three to give you right now. OK, great. There are still, I see a hand over here. It's a little tough for me, guys, with the lights. But, um, but the, find someone with a mic and get them. OK, yes. Hey, David, quick question. How important is it for couples to be together when they meet with you as far as the strategic planning going forward? Not only How important is it for a couple to meet with me? Both partners. I'm, that doesn't sound like a loaded question to me. OK, well, here's my answer. We're not going to take up much time with this one. I think it's very, very important unless she feels otherwise. Uh, Michelle, Bob Wallace here. Hey, Robert, did you know that your name means bright flame in German? I would tell you what it means in Irish, but yeah, I have to. Yeah, don't do that. OK. <laughs> yes, Bob. OK, David, uh, the question I have for you is kind of a two-part question. First part is, what is the most insightful question an existing client could ask of you? And the corollary, what is the most insightful question a prospective new client could ask you? Wow. Um, I really do think that uh, the most insightful question from a current client would not necessarily be the same for every current client, okay? Because every client is going to have a different thing near and dear to their heart that might warrant an appropriate amount of clarification. But in a more kind of macro sense, broad overview, um, I think any question geared at understanding this concept of what I mean about embracing volatility but managing against risk. We're in a secular flat market, but we're going to get a positive return. I assert these things, but they're, by definition, not easy to fully demonstrate and prove. Questions revolving around that theme are very, very legitimate. And I probably have a better venue to answer those when I meet with clients individually. And I seek to address those things in my weekly commentaries as well. Um, as far as from a, for a prospective client, I would think that they would like to know what is the value that they could get from the Bonson Group that they could not easily get elsewhere? I have an unlimited amount of confidence in my ability to answer that question. But I don't ever like sounding as arrogant as I do, so it just <laughs> is what it is. But they, wow, that's, a, that's an interesting one, Bob. All right, we'll come over to this side of the room. Anything over here? I see a hand there. Oh. Is it for me? Here it is. Uh, David. What is the, is Bob Merritt over here to your left? Left? Yes. Um, what do you think Obama's administration is going to do with the um, economy, health care, and where do you think the uh, estate tax is going to end up? 
what do I think the Obama administration is going to do with the economy, and what do I think the estate tax is going to end up? Obamacare. Plus Obamacare. Yeah. Okay, so that's just a real quick one. All right. <laughs> Six minutes and 43 seconds. Okay, I'm sorry. I will let the cat out of the bag for those in the room. When we referred earlier to one of my extracurricular activities being politics, this is not the nonpartisan kind of politics. I'm kind of a partisan guy. I'm not really supposed to be, but here's the thing. I don't really have to wonder what Obama's going to do with the economy, because as you may know, he's been our president. So we already know what he's done with the economy, so that part's easy. So just look, and you can answer that. It's been very, very slow growth. Some of that's his fault, some of it's not. Um, I think that's a fair answer to it. Uh, Obamacare, I do not believe, will be law of the land in a year from now. Uh, if I'm wrong about that, then I still think that the implementation of Obamacare, because the court doesn't punt it, which I think they will, and because Obama doesn't lose the election, which I think he might, and Congress doesn't repeal it, which I think they will, if somehow it is still the law of the land, I still believe it's going to take on a massive reshaping, because it, a lot of it is dysfunctional in the way that it's, that it's currently set up. And that is actually a nonpartisan comment. I would say that no matter what. Um, and then the third part was the estate tax. Well, and then, yeah, this is, by the way, there is a little flyer in your, in your uh, things as well. I'm going to do a little wine and cheese event at the Ritz in a couple weeks talking exclusively only about the estate tax for, for folks of uh, a uh, uh, good, meaningful net worth where it could potentially affect them. Here's what I will tell you. Um, if the very worst, worst, worst case thing were to happen, those that want the most kind of burdensome estate tax get their way, then the exclusion would still only be three and a half million, not one million. So I still am believing that seven million for a married couple, three and a half million for a single is probably the worst case scenario. I don't, but unfortunately I would see that rate going back up into the 50s, not into the 35% it is now. So state tax is vulnerable. Um, even if a Republican were to win the White House, you know, bipartisan stuff and everything, it's going to be difficult. Um, I will never, if a state tax is fully repealed, I would not let my clients act as if it were. I would always pretend that there will be some estate tax because we can't afford to plan as if it goes away with this kind of schizophrenic government that could bring it back and put it on and bring it back and bring it on. The last 10 years, this whole thing that stemmed out of the 2001 Bush tax cut has just been abysmally dysfunctional, the lack of predict predictability. Oh boy, we're cooking. Yeah, okay, Mr. Nyberg. Yes, uh, working? Is that working? Yeah. Uh, other than letting the Nybergs into your practice, what is the biggest mistake you've ever made? No, you covered it, Rick. And, and hey, what, look, I didn't need any time off the clock. <laughs> and what have you learned from it? Okay, what is the biggest mistake I made in my practice, and what have I learned from it? Yeah, I mean, obviously, things related to, to you know, clients that, uh, in hindsight, you wish you hadn't worked with, things like that. You know I love you and Joyce, but I, there are issues. I mean, I mean this very seriously, and I'm blessed to be in a position now where I can mean it. But um, no, I don't, I, there are certain types of people I don't want to work with. And so to be very honest with you, that, that would be the issue is over the years, there may have been personality types that I should not have let on the island. Um, but from an investment standpoint, which is a little bit, thank you, yeah. From an investment standpoint, Rick, I think that the biggest mistake I ever made was that I was so right about 2008. I believed for a couple of years that housing was in a collapse. I believed for a couple of years that Countrywide, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, AIG, Lehman Brothers, all of them were a disaster. We got out of all of them, and we still got hit because I underestimated the contagion effect that would take place very temporarily and, and on a relative basis, not nearly as dramatically, but I underestimated the effect that that kind of financial chain of events would have on Procter Gamble and so forth. So I, I, uh, I, I thought about that every day for a long time. I've gone through therapy. <laughs> we move on. I don't know if it's still on. And that's why we love you. Thank you, so my don't friend. Waste your suffering. Thank you, thank you. Okay, one more question and. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up, all right? I, I was just so quick and efficient. Anything else? I see one here in the middle, Michelle, and then we'll, are, are, is this gonna be a good one? A lot of pressure. I get three minutes and 42 seconds to answer it, so. I don't right. know if it's a good one or not. Hey, ditto, mega ditto's on a great job tonight. But you. Uh, if T-bills are gonna hoover between two and 3% and we're gonna keep flooding the market, what should we expect from Dave Bonson in our portfolios at the end of the year. What returns should I be looking for? Yeah. Um, okay, so Wayne, 
Wayne, first of all, I need to know, did you know that your name means wagon builder in Old English? <laughs> if any of you think I made any of these things up tonight, you go home and Google it, you'll see. This has become my new hobby. I needed more to do. <laughs> so my wagon building friend, here's the answer to your question that is not nearly as challenging as you think it is. I will not lie to you by answering because I have no idea. <laughs> Anyone who wants to say that they know the return that they will deliver in a six or seven month period is by definition either putting you in cash, which is uh, malpractice, or they're lying. I don't know. But I can tell you what I would reasonably expect short of a contagion event, a geopolitical event, a 9-11 event, uh, a Japanese earthquake kind of a thing. Those issues, obviously, that are those black swans. I would expect that we're in a sustained period of very modest returns. I'm expecting at this point, we've already gotten the 10% kicker in equities, right? We got it real quickly here into the year. I'd expect some volatility along the way, but until after the election, I don't see a big breakout up or breakout down. But you kind of answered um, something, uh, you kind of presupposed something on the 10-year bond. I'm not sure I'll agree. Uh, fluctuate between two and 3%, well, that sort of begs the question. If it doesn't go below 2%, then it means things didn't get very bad. Okay, we hit 167, 1.67 last year with August and all that Greece fund stuff. And, and if it goes above 3%, it means we probably had a premature rebellion in the bond market. I know that rebellion's coming, but I, I would agree. I don't think it's coming this year, but I, I could see us hitting. Look, it was only a year and four months ago. We were up at 4% north, four, north of 4% on the 10-year. So we could get above 3% this year on that, and that would really have a big effect on a lot of things. But, but honestly, Wayne, I believe that very few clients of mine that started January 1 and ended December 31 and represent some type of median representation of the type of portfolio management I'm doing, I'd be very surprised if anybody was not between a 6 and 11 percent range. This will not be a superb year in the, in the 20 percent range. I don't expect to lose money this year. But I have to give you that caveat because some event could happen that could dramatically change things tomorrow. So I just want to be honest. It's not a cop-out. I hope that's helpful. Okay. So what we're going to do here now, as we get ready to wrap up, um, I have a minute and 11, but the Q&A is done. I'm going to put one more slide up, and I want to close this stuff up.